This episode of the podcast is supported by Audible. You can download and listen to the world's best storytelling. I use it all the time to and from work. You can listen to audiobooks, original series and more on their free app. To get your free 30-day subscription, which includes a free book, click on the link in our show notes and enjoy. Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. Today I had a great conversation with an old friend of mine called Daniel G who has become one of the UK's most highly respected sports lawyers and he focuses on football and his clients are great. They're like Premier League footballers, agents, clubs and he's the guy involved in all of the contracts with the players and, and clubs. So really, really interesting. He's got some crazy stories and we had a really good conversation about how the game's changed, uh, broadcasters and what effect they've had on football and social media, all of those things and of course how you become a football lawyer which if you want to be a lawyer, football law is pretty cool. So we speak about that. And he's just done a book called Done Deal, which is really cool. I'm listening to it on Audible and you can click the link in the show notes uh, later. Enjoy. Hey, it's Lewis. Welcome to the podcast. Enjoy our conversations anytime, anywhere. Cool, we're live. Daniel, thank you very much for coming in. Pleasure, thanks for having me. Pleasure. We were just saying it's been maybe 10, 12 years since we saw each other last. It's making me feel old. I definitely had more hair. I had more spare time. <laughs> I didn't have as many kids or a uh, wife, but actually we were talking about kids' schools and stuff, and that, that's, how we've, that's how we've progressed in life. I know. It's sad. It's sad. I don't know what happened. I'm just about holding on to my hair. <laughs> I also have kids. I also got married. Crazy. <laughs> crazy look i've been tracking your progress remotely for a while and you seem to be doing some really great stuff thank you yeah, yeah. it's it's, no, it's like anything really I, I remember when i was even at uni and then when we met when we all moved down to london together the aim was to try and get into the sports industry to work in football more generally to do the things that you like doing and are quite passionate and you, you know enjoy learning about and lucky enough the the long-term project as um, yeah as sort of so you never made it as a professional footballer Unfortunately, I don't think that was ever going to be on the books. <laughs> my, my best claim to fame on football was getting a trial with Ford FC Motors, but that Ford was FC, literally that's, well, it's better that was than, about it. Um, it's better than me. I um, I always wanted to be a professional footballer, but I broke my leg when I was about ten. Oh dear. Yeah, that was the end of. Is that the excuse? That was the end of a very promising <laughs> career. So I had to focus on study which I wasn't very good at either <laughs> how did you end up getting into the football industry beginning my book actually the forwards all about like, how a lot of us are big football sports and this fans. is done deal it's done yeah. deal the book so um and and a lot of the forward is just literally about how I gained an interest or a passion or just a, I guess a little bit of obsession into football and wanting to know about how things work on the pitch off the pitch um you know we all we all consume content in lots of different ways back in the day as you well know it was a couple of pages in the newspaper um, about the particular team that you supported and up in Liverpool it was a Liverpool echo it was a little bit of transfer news or something and and, and after that that sort of sparked my interest after that it was teletext and cfax yeah, we had a I few pages to be able to, yeah. to read after literally running home from school every day to see what the latest news is and then um, I'm not sure if you remember as well uh, my dad was completely obsessed with these club call phone lines where you phoned up um, a, tra- a number for like two pounds a minute and then you got the latest a snippet of what was going on or otherwise. Remember that. So yeah, dad, dad spent fortunes on that <laughs> and then actually became the early adopter of the internet and team talk and the rest because he realized that actually it was a lot cheaper to go on the internet than it was to phone these lines. So this long and short story of it is, you know, that sparked my interest, the, the need for information, the need for content, the need just to know what was going on really. And then from university, from doing a law degree, I was able in my third year to do a dissertation on the Bosman ruling, free transfer side of things, EU free movement issues, and then a master's degree in football broadcasting rights. Um, nice. And this is which uni did you go to? In Manchester. Yeah. So uh, did that and then went, came down to London in 2005. And the idea then was to so you train, trained up in Manchester? Uh, no, trained in, down in, uh, I did my LP, LPC, which is yeah. law school in Chester, and then yeah. moved down to do my two years training contract in, in London. And um literally told everyone I knew and bored everyone to pieces about the football and sports stuff that I knew and wanted to do and any time there was any football or sports related stuff um, you know the partners knew that I was the one at least to, to get involved because I half knew what I was talking about. Nice so you really put yourself out there. Exactly and that, and that was the way really and that's what happened after my two years at Jones Day I went to Field Fish in my previous firm that I was there for about eight years and the idea was that whenever 
it wasn't really a strategic plan at the time because I didn't really have the network that a lot of more established lawyers had. Yeah, but yeah. it was any time there was a piece of football work or any time there was some sports stuff going on, I would literally, whenever the conflict checks came in, which was to say, can we act for this person against this person or this company against this company? I would just email the, the lawyer and say, oh, I'd love to get involved in this. And that led to some really cool takeover work with quite a few different clubs, led to some really nice, interesting advisory work. And then that built towards what I do more of now, which is talent work, which is helping agents and players with all of their sort of legal needs, I guess. Crazy, you must have some brilliant stories. Lots that I can't tell. <laughs> are, you doing, are you doing all this over WhatsApp now? You must have done like fax, what, fax back in the day? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, everyone everyone still thinks faxes take place and things <laughs> happen like that, which just isn't really the, the case anymore. I mean, I, I listened to, I, I phoned someone up the other day and their answer machine message was, if you want to send a fax, send it to this number. I was like, what, people still send faxes these days? <laughs> So, yeah, yeah, I mean, ultimately, a lot of the stuff, like in your business and like in everyone's business, is 24-7, yeah, yeah. 365 days a year. And it is three in the morning if you've got a US client. It is, you know, um, demanding stuff on occasion at particular times of the year, deadline day being one, even though that, you know, depends on the busyness of particular things. Yeah. But also people needing instant responses to quite difficult conversations or quite difficult topics sometimes. And sometimes the instant answer isn't usually the right answer sometimes yeah, yeah. needs to be considered a bit more. And what's it been like? Is it what you expected when you entered the sports world? Or? It's pretty demanding is, is the truth. Um, you know, uh, Holly, my wife and my kids have to be <laughs> pretty understanding on occasion just because, you know, we had a few a few summers ago when the transfer window end, um, kept on going till the end of the month. Um, you know, it was a bit silly for me to go away during August, but that was the time that we had. So it used to be the whole of August? It used to be the whole of August, right. at least for the Premier League and the Championship. And now it's sort of... The, the window closed but, but yeah. the Thursday before the first game of the season um, and so I would constantly for those couple of years two or three years you know have deals to do where you get a call from the agent you're on the literally on the beach maybe you've had a beer or two already at lunchtime yeah. and then you're like right the deal's going to be done in the next 24 hours so it can be quite reactionary a little bit pressurized but you know um, that's the that's the nature of the game and you know it's a lot of the time I'll still pinch myself to say be like I'm doing something that, you know, a lot of people would be, you know, really not jealous is the wrong word, love really to like, love to do yeah, and to yeah. get involved in more. And your, so your clients are the agents or the players or the clubs? Exactly. Yeah. They tend to be more um, uh, agents and players because if I work with too many clubs, then I'll be conflicted when I do transfers particularly. Yes, yeah, so many so, more players than clubs. Exactly. And usually because the volume of them, the work that comes in from players and uh, agents is usually maybe not as... Um, high um, value but is usually high volume so there's a lot more players and a lot more agents doing transactions if it's um, a transfer but also if it's you know something's gone wrong they've tweeted something they shouldn't have done maybe they've had a red card maybe they've been disciplined by the club maybe there's a story going up in the press maybe they need some social media training you know maybe they actually just need to buy a house or you know god forbid they're getting divorced or something so it's all of those so they're about to like tweet that they hate their manager yeah, but they run it idea. by you first. Well, I hope, okay. <laughs> well, the tr- actually, the truth about it is we work with quite a lot of digital agencies that work with sports men and women and talent who um, you know will mainly do that social media communication on behalf of the the player or will draft certain you know um, will draft particular statements or phrases or things and then give the player the option of which ones they want to go with with the associated you know uh, pictures and the rest and even more broadly you know a lot of these very good agencies are you know mapping out a creative um, brand picture for these players one to five years out really in mm-hmm. order to be able to for those players to engage the brands that they want to for whatever reason that might be maybe they yeah. love their fashion maybe they actually um, love the environment maybe it is because they have particular causes that they feel very strongly about interesting so how how's sounds like it's changed a lot but how's the game changed since you started and this has been what 15 years you've been yeah I mean the, the truth is, yeah, and more actually I mean I came down into yeah 15 16 yeah 15 years um, in the beginning I guess um, well there's a few things ultimately initially I was I wasn't doing as much player and agency work so I was doing takeover work oh. um, so we worked on a number of pretty high profile deals back in the day so in a way for me I wasn't really the main client 
partner so I wasn't the one dealing sometimes on the sharp end of particular yeah, things yeah. and as I've become more senior then you sort of have to understand how to manage clients their expectations you know r- responsiveness and their ability to be able to tell people sometimes what they don't want to hear as well as the truth um, and so if, if things have changed I think ultimately with technology um, and the, the the communication phenomenon if the way I describe it um, it's all um, changed in terms of expectation management everybody expects everything now or yesterday um, and a lot of the time some of my some of my important principles are not necessarily that you can't give instantaneous answers to things but sometimes the best answer isn't the, the quickest there's an idea about being responsive and dedicated and being available when is necessary especially for emergencies etc yeah, but yeah. you know everybody becomes very demanding because they think there are easy answers but the truth is when it's probably got to a lawyer the, the answer probably isn't that easy anymore is the truth yeah, yeah. and also i mean the other bit just very briefly is you know um where i'm in an industry where as much as people know that they need to use lawyers sometimes they don't actually understand what lawyers are doing for the benefit of them the agents or the players so just to give one brief example we were helping negotiate a deal a couple of summers ago and the deal i actually held up the deal for four hours not intentionally because it was i want that's what i wanted to do but because um the the selling club hadn't given us comfort on a particular thing and the email hadn't come through. So I had said to the agent, it was like, right, we're going to announce the, the deal. The press release is ready to go, et cetera, et cetera. I was like, no, we're not doing anything. And the player's definitely not signing the contract until I get that email from the club saying this bit is taken yeah. care of and all right. And he was like, okay, that's fine. And the hours go on, the hours go on. And the buying club's going absolutely ballistic with <laughs> yeah. me for saying, why can't we announce? And so anyway, it gets sorted in the end. But ultimately, yeah. um, a lot of the stuff that is most important for me is to try and explain to players and agents why a particular clause or why a particular phrase of wording actually is very important um, and that can sometimes be a difficult yeah. job because they actually just want the deal over the line and want things yeah done. what i found really interesting is that um it seems to be unique to football but you know if you want to leave a job you can resign and you give your notice mm-hmm. period done um whereas in football i mean they're, they're, they're beholden to their contract yeah if you don't want to play go sit in the reserves and on the bench how did that come about it's, it's a really good point. So the, there, there have been quite a few cases actually about this specific area, which is what happens if a player decides he no longer wants to play for the club anymore? Can that player terminate his contract and can he just leave on a free transfer and then decide to sign with another club um, with no transfer free and then take all effectively then take a higher wage because there's no transfer fee involved there's been cases and we can uh, I can provide the links to it if necessary there's some really interesting cast cases yeah, we'll stick it in the show notes yeah which yeah. is the court of arbitration for sport and there have been cases called Webster Methuselah De Sanctis Diara and all of those cases are to do with um, players deciding to breach their contract and leave for a variety of different reasons and then the the club that owned had the registration and had the employment contract suing the player and the new club for lots of things, but mainly the remaining value of his transfer fee. And that's what happened, if you remember, with Adrian Mutu back in the day. Yeah, yeah, no, I remember, yeah. So yeah. he was sacked for snorting cocaine, um, moved to eventually um, to uh, Juve and went to yeah. Italy as well, went to Italy and then moved between Juve and a, another lonely club. And Chelsea came after Juve, and I think it was Livorno, I think, for the remaining value of his transfer fee because they said that Chelsea's loss because they were able to sack him because he'd reputedly breached his contract was the remaining transfer fee. Also, the, the agent's commission that wasn't paid and other associated costs now that's always then the risk and that, i'm not saying and they won well they never so to date they haven't actually been able to get their their money either from uve livorno i think or mutu is the truth but so they won was, in court but they won in court but well they know actually the latest case was actually the the two italian clubs were not liable for the transfer fee right now, i'm right. not sure where they can go now with that but the the overall point is yeah we're not living in the normal employment it's world of just being able to give a few months notice because we're looking at i'm looking at gareth bale at the moment mm. you know and the guy's obviously fallen out with sedan or you know not being played for whatever reason clearly wants to move but unable to because he's so expensive so his options are limited, right? You you sit there and you, well, there's 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 probably about three different options, three or four different options. The the first is yes to stay put, um, to try and get his chance when potentially there are more injuries. Like I remember chatting on CNN a while back, which was I remember when Beckham 
um, was at Real Madrid, frozen out by Capello, but then decided to knuckle down and had a great second half of the season when there were a few injuries. And then he had a great end of his end of his year before he then went to the Galaxy, I think. So, you know, things change very quickly in football. Injuries, True, yeah. a change of manager even, you know, the political situation at Madrid is not straightforward. The other option always is, you know, effectively to take a pay cut and, and, and play. But ultimately, you know, we're in that phase now where there are a number, it's an actually quite an interesting outlier situation where we're in a phase where there are a number of very high profile players that ideally may, w- would like to move club. We're talking about Bale, Neymar, yeah. Pogba came out even yeah, this yeah. week after yeah. the game saying, you know, the situation isn't particularly easy. Even and Saha are, wanted to move. Yeah, and, the, and yeah. you know, there were rumours about Mbappe as well. So, you know, it, it's an interesting position where there are a lot of very highly paid, high profile players that have been unsettled this summer. But the truth is there are only a number of very... Um, uh, well, elite clubs that can one afford those players, and two, you know, sometimes those type of players are a little bit mercurial, and maybe actually that upsets the the dressing room dynamic in different ways. So is this? It's, just, it's interesting. So the the power really lies with the club here. Well, um, in that particular case, it looks like it was to a degree because. Bale was rumoured to be close to signing with for a Chinese club. Yeah. And then um, Perez, um, quite close to when the deal was about to happen, then pulled back and said, no, unless you pay us a transfer fee as well, then we're not going Is that anywhere. because, so I've heard, I'd correct me if I'm wrong, but so in China, the club has to pay 100% That's in what taxes. I read. That's what I read, tra- yeah. transfer tax, yeah. for anything, which is obviously you know, Crazy. a huge number. So they then can't afford to then pay the fee on top? Well, yeah, ultimately it goes to a slightly wider point, which is, you know, on any type of club transaction that the buying club has a finite pot of money is the truth and that's usually for transfer fee for agents commission for wages for bonuses and and, and the like relocation costs etc so you know ultimately the pot is what the pot is if the Chinese club have budgeted X amount of money um, for the transfer of Gareth Bale and suddenly someone puts an extra 40 million pounds on top it's basically the equivalent of chipping is the truth yeah, for, yeah, yeah. you know you know just before you're about to exchange in a house and the, yeah. the the buyer the seller just saying actually we want x number or depending on the negotiation position the buyer saying actually i'm not willing to accept that for the following reasons yeah so you know in the end football is a bit of an outlier but it's still you know commercial commercial bargaining power in different ways and are you doing are you doing a lot of international work or have you been focusing on on like premier league uk <coughs> Um, well, it depends actually. So usually, if a player is signing um, a, a foreign employment contract, so in Holland, Germany, um, Belgium, whatever it may be, then because each national jurisdiction has its own employment laws, I will advise that there should be local lawyers, um, local employment lawyers that should get involved in those type of deals. Yeah. Now, I can obviously help based on my experience of what I've seen in lots of different contracts to be able to say what to put in, what to maybe avoid, what to clarify, etc. Usually my experience is um, when players are renegotiating their contracts in the in the UK, usually Premier League and EFL, uh, and then also when foreign players and their agents are coming in, are transferring in to, to the UK simply because I'm a UK quali- English and Wales qualified yeah, yeah. lawyer, and that's sort of where my expertise probably lies yeah. the best. What effect have you seen... Um, of the, with the financial fair play rule um, that's been interesting when I had a chat with my uh, I went camping on the mm-hmm. weekend had a good chat with a friend of mine called Mark he's a Leicester City fan mm-hmm. and uh, he feels it's actually you know they'd, they'd probably do better without it and so yep. it's quite interesting well there's a number of there's a number of interesting levers generally so um, you know prior to the regs coming in 2012 I think it was now at least the UEFA regulations because there are Premier League and EFL iterations as well right, similar okay. rules in slightly different ways you know um, the, the UEFA benchmarking report which is the financial report that gets circulated every year which is which I'd, I'd recommend listeners to listen to if they're interested in what read rather if um, you know people are interested in the financial aspects of football the the, the trajectory of losses was quite astronomical so Cumulative club losses in that particular season were 1.7 billion euros. Wow! Wow! Now, fast forward um, seven years on, and actually, you are having a potentially cumulative profit for the first time um, across European club competitions, and that's very much one of the stats that I was researching for for Dundeal was to have a look pre and post financial fair play rule implementation and actually then the domestic regulations as well and you know it's actually now the outlier for Premier League clubs to make loss 
losses really? is the truth. Yeah. So uh, a couple of seasons ago now, 18 out of the 20 clubs, Premier League clubs made profit. Now, the, there are a few other levers for that. One is obviously increased cost control, i.e. on the financial fair play rules side. The um, the Premier League rules on the what's called the short-term cost control rules, which have actually just been removed now, which which basically said that you couldn't spend £7 million more on wages than you did in the previous season. That was one of the regulations that was previously in place. But the other, obviously, on the revenue generation side is the, you know, the huge broadcasting deals. And you've had two, three big cycles now flat growth for domestic revenues um, recently but still you know the the modeling from there's a great um, great guy on Twitter and a great blogger called Swiss Ramble and he wrote some great pieces on what he expects the new broadcasting deal to reach for each particular club for next season and he was of the view that he thought that probably the winners of the Premier League next year will earn upwards of 170 million pounds wow. and the the bottom place team will be near enough 100 million pounds whereas this year it was around 150 to 95 or so what about the gap between I mean you've actually probably got top six let's say mm. um, but without without some of the clubs below being able to spend and invest on players do you see that gap remaining well how are they gonna it's an interesting one. I read, I, I watched, sorry, I watched, I listened to a really interesting podcast which said the the rules of the game have changed a bit in terms of transfers, which is, you know, 20, as actually um, Gary Neville was talking on the okay, his podcast, yeah. it wasn't just a random guy. Um, <laughs> and he was saying, you know, in years gone by, you know, Crystal Palace wouldn't be able to afford to reject £70 million for Wilfred Zaha, for example. Um, you know, the top players in the league in any one season would move tend to move to the top clubs the difference now is is that anyone outside of the top six can afford to keep their player if they if they can keep if they yeah, psychologically yeah. you know i guess from a, ret- a retention point of view can actually keep them happy by paying them more money but the thing is though if Saha goes and you have no one to replace him you're going against you have to spend 70 million maybe you've got someone coming up yep. and you know the, the sheer if you if you go down to the champ, championship, yep. I mean the amount of money you lose is super hard to get back. It's true, and 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 this is the other thing that I mentioned in the book as well, which is you know I I've, it's it's totally um, crackers to me. I mean I can understand the economics to some degree, but yeah. you take one Basaka and um, Zaha potentially and value them at let's just say 130 million pounds. Crystal Palace, I mean I don't know, but let's just say maybe their its value as a club would maybe be. 200 million or 250 million let's just say if we're talking bullish numbers you know when in what industry anywhere in the world would you have potentially um money flow from two employees almost equaling half of the actual value of a particular company it's crazy it just doesn't doesn't happen i know but then to replace them i mean you're gonna have to spend near enough the same well i mean that's the other thing that's that's changed actually if we go back to one of the bits that you mentioned yeah. a while back which is there are a lot of very interesting data analytics consultancy companies that have uh, been involved in the football industry for a number of years one of the takeovers that we did a few years ago uh, i'll mention the guys at 21st club that are brilliant um they did a fantastic on-field piece to do on-field due diligence piece oh, right. and that was basically looking at the value of the squad looking at um uh the combinations of particular players looking how um from a legacy perspective whether the the squad was aging whether actually a lot of investment would be needed inside a particular period of time who were the best player combinations without within a squad who were the most valuable guys that maybe were overvalued and um, might be susceptible to to move on etc so um the interesting thing on the takeover side as much as the player and agency side is um you know Firstly, there's a lot more interesting DD going on, especially when players are being bought and sold, for example. Um, and so all the analytics on field, passing, running, exactly, the whole thing. exactly. Yeah. And there's some. There's a great book I just finished reading called Data Hackers, um, which is all about that, um, all about the the data driven side of the football business now, and actually the psychological and physiological side of things. There's a there was a brilliant uh, chapter about. Um, the psychoanalysis of footballers. So there's a few clubs um, in particular territories now that um, require their players to fill in questionnaires and have um, psychometric tests done in order to understand how, what type of character traits they exhibit in order then to be able to work out the particular mix of characters within a squad that's necessary for an optimal outcome. 
It's great, and we we do that for all leadership roles. Most companies, when hiring, do that. And if, you know, when you're when you're looking at spending however many million a year on salaries, I mean, it's vital. I'd be worried to see what I, which one I fall within. I, the, well, but, God knows what I'm. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I was when I was looking at the modelling, I was like, I probably fall in between about two or three categories in some ways. But that's my own self awareness. They're interesting, but they, the psychometric tests are really, really accurate. I mean, I, I've done quite a few, and I, 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 although I don't want to sometimes, I really identify myself within these. Mm. And, and they're, you know, they're used as part of the decision-making process mm. and, and stuff. And also, I guess the managers can use them for development and getting the mindset right. Yeah, and also, um, interestingly, in this case, it was everybody was told about each other's um, category. So then people would understand the makeup of someone else. So then they would be able to go. So they were broken up into different color categories, yeah. more or less. Yeah, yeah. So they would say, you know, if you're red, you know that if you're arguing with the blue, it's not going to benefit them. What you actually need to do is be more conciliatory in a particular way. And yeah. then in some ways, there was a, the, then the discussion was about whether you had too many blue categories in a team lineup in a particular day, because that might lead to a particular type of outcome. It's brilliant. We've, we've done a, I've done a company session on that. And so there's, there's quite a few. It's like you get blue green yellow red mm. the interesting thing is you learn about yourself but then you learn how to communicate yeah. more effectively with your team members and for football I mean that's awesome I love that I'd love to be in the dressing room when they go through that yeah I don't still know how many actually do it at the top level but in the end you know the other point is is that you know managers now as much as you know we um either vilify or congratulate them on their tactical acumen or awareness and particular substitutions or whatever ultimately more than ever they are be- having to become you know fantastic man managers at particular times yeah and yeah. you know i think as much as there are very hard jobs in life that is a very hard job in being able to juggle 25 26 very successful sportsmen um in order to um move them towards a one one collective goal because in some ways football can be a very selfish industry i don't mean that no, absolutely from a controversial perspective yeah. but ultimately yeah. you know footballers are giving up most of their lives for the pursuit of glory for the pursuit of something more for the pursuit of doing something which will obviously hopefully have an impact on them their family and sort of yeah, provide yeah. a bit of a legacy i guess yeah yeah how have you seen broadcasters change football well because that must be uh, yeah fun- fundamentally here's yeah. the truth i mean there's we can go backwards and then we can go forwards. I mean, yeah. the you know back to ninety two with the actual, I guess, first incarnation of the the Premier League as it was, money not being shared in as much of an egalitarian way, the top leagues taking more of the um, the lion's share, being able then to be able to invest more significantly in player transfer wages, you know, stadium and infrastructure upgrades, etc. To um, the situation we're in now where we have um, globally a £9.2 billion revenue model wow. um, just a Premier League. for just live Premier League rights, which is extraordinary. Um, so this is it, global global rights. Correct. And yeah. so when we've seen quite a uplift in the non-UK rights, we've actually seen quite a, uh, well, I think it was a 7% decrease in the amount that BT, Sky, and now Amazon are paid for, for those rights for this season and the next two seasons coming. So the, um, you know, are the amounts still absolutely huge? Yes. Um, has there been sort of flatline growth for, for domestic rights? Yes. Are they sort of at their peak quite possibly within the, the, the subscription model that we're seeing now. The question mark is, and I've said this on a few podcasts to be fair and to, to a lot of people is, you know, there's a, there's a few interesting things happening at the moment. The, the first is, you know, um, someone was telling me yesterday, one of the partners um, at Sheridan's was, was actually telling me that Netflix and Amazon Prime have over, I think it's Amazon Prime, it's definitely Netflix, I think it's Amazon Prime, have overtaken BBC Two and Channel Four as the third and fourth most watched platforms in the UK. Wow! By by hours streamed or hours watched. Yeah. yeah. Now it's maybe more difficult to be. I able, can believe that. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it makes make sense with all yeah. the binge viewing and everything else that, that I do. I know on particular yeah. programs as well. So the, the, there is there and and viewing habits for younger generations are changing exponentially now, which leads to a number of interesting questions, which is, is the subscription model, the Sky subscription model, the BT subscription model becoming more outmoded and outdated? Now, the the outlier is everybody still wants to watch live Premier League football, which keeps everyone on those platforms. But there's lots of cord cutting generations now that don't subscribe to um, a monthly package that will happily pay 
is it i can't remember eight nine, or nine pounds for netflix nine, uh, nine yeah, or yeah a month now i have amazon prime as well to be able to get my for me and my missus to be able to get our packages the it's, next day etc yeah, etc et yeah. et and do you have a sky subscription as i well? do have a sky BT subscription Sports as well. i don't i have that on my phone at least because it's cheaper with ee so i just right, watch okay. it on my phone sometimes Fine, right, right. but yeah I, th I and i think we're, we're getting to that saturation point in a way and i think a lot of the younger generations if not us maybe we're the lost generation of um feeling more comfortable about watching um uh sky and sky sports for example on a big tv where you know my younger cousins and everyone else no one's watching football on a television anymore is the truth um and that's only i think going to grow and the reason why i give all of that background is because i think sooner rather than later um there will be a push from the premier league uefa are already doing it to provide a ott and over the top internet enabled uh, live football product Oh really? Wow! I, I think that it's is the, box the that inevitability. Just... Well, it, even what I mean is, is that you know, the, there's there's no coincidence that the type of um, chief executive that the Premier League were looking at over a particular period of time to to replace Mr. Scudamore was a broadcasting. Um, OTT executive right. now that obviously hasn't necessarily ended up being the case but I think what will certainly happen or there's definite uh, moves towards actually the Premier League taking back its product and deciding to broadcast it on its own channel for a subscription base basically the Netflix of the football industry interesting maybe yeah although you see like I, I watch a lot of UFC mm. they've now partnered with um, ESPN mm. they work with Fox so the, the I mean because the, the other argument is focus on what you're good at Yep. develop the product and let other people distribute it because yep. you have Disney coming into the market now yep. you've got Netflix Amazon I've, I've, I actually use Virgin and I have um, so I do pay for Sky Sports I pay for BT Sports mm. um, I also I have an Amazon Prime too mm. and up until last week we have Netflix but I thought you know what, I've got too many things so I cancelled the Netflix yep. but I, I don't often watch TV on, in my living room mm. in front of my TV because I've got kids and I rarely get like the 90 minutes to sit. So I'm yep. watching on my phone a lot, mobile devices. And most younger people I speak to, they don't even have a Sky or Virgin subscription. Yep. It's quite expensive. And it's also, I think um, there's a bigger thing, which is sort of the disaggregation of television, which is, you know, everyone wants things on demand. And for the things that you can't have on demand, then, um, you know, you want that, you want to be able to then have easy access to be able to watch that particular program. And, you know, the truth is, is that, I don't really. I don't watch any of the Sky programs. No, I don't watch anything. I don't. Nothing. That you know, I don't really watch the movies that often. So going back to the first point about what's changed and what will change, you know, back in 1992, the Sky executive said that Premier League football would be the battering ram for their satellite TV services. <laughs> it's still the case. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, absolutely. And um, this amount of time on, because you know, I think there would be a, a huge and Sky. I am sure realised this, which is there would be a huge audience switch off if suddenly either the Premier League decided to take back its rights to do it themselves, or they didn't get the lion's share of those rights full stop yeah the problem at the moment i was speaking to a few friends the other day about it is if i want to watch premier league football i have to you ha all, all of the games or as many as you can um you have to do sky sports and bt yep and amazon now for this year amazon and Prime. amazon so yep. so it's crazy so it's like three platforms in the uk all all pretty expensive um it's crazy you don't know you don't know, you don't know what to you've got now tv but that's a just a sky sports pass i think yes yeah, so you buy you buy that on a day on you a daily a basis basically day pass yeah. or yeah so it's at the moment it seems to be a little just fragmenting yeah and you know i i wrote about this actually um in my broadcasting master's dissertation back in the day oh, wow. in um, 2003 which was you know the 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 competition authorities at the time believed that competition between broadcasters was actually beneficial for the consumer but the ultimate fallacy of that is that actually when you don't have one product that sorry when you have one product that is then split rather than a number of whole products that then others can compete on in the end you get a fragmented product rather than a complete product in order to compete on so i'd always argued for some time that the best way to satisfy consumer demand is to have one full premier league product which has all of the games available and then sell that to the top three broadcasters and let them compete on price rather than the exclusivity model which they went with 
with, which was um, exclusive package, exclusive package, exclusive package, and then we'll sell exclusive packages, which are the differentiator to different broadcasters. The ultimate problem from a consumer welfare perspective is you're triplicate, tri- triplicating, is that a word? Um, the <laughs> yeah. costs, um, where otherwise you could otherwise compete on price for a whole product just in separate ways yeah interesting and you'd have th- so you'd have three in the uk yeah so your amazon your your um, bt and your why sky not? and some might just be a basic level um that you don't get all of the associated bells and whistles with and gary neville and carragher whether you like no, them or, jose? Not. or yeah no <laughs> jose or the opposite where you, you know you have 3d you know brilliant angles fantastic commentary and great content etc yeah, yeah i think it'll be hard for the Premier League to take that all of that back. I mean, you're suiting 9.7 billion. Yep. I mean, you know, generating that on their own, tough. I agree. And yeah. I think what will likely happen, UEFA are doing it on particular territories, from particular territories, and um, you'll see the move by the W, um, the Women's Football uh, League, the WSL, which is just Women's Football Super League, who have just entered, the FA have just entered an agreement um, with the provider to have all of the games streamed live over the internet, apart from some games that BT Sport have. Brilliant. So that would be available for anyone to be able to access on the internet. I think it would be an incremental approach from the Premier League, which is for particular territories, maybe for the next cycle they may actually say we're going to partner with um, a technology provider or a back-end provider for a particular s- jurisdiction Singapore or Thailand or Facebook whatever else somewhere it may be. yeah and India. yeah ex- yeah and then just say we are going to have a Premier League channel that is available for subscription for anyone in that particular territory to be able to buy those games rather than through the broadcaster and let's see what happens yeah and I love that I love that how social, probably the last big big thing we speak about, mm. um, social media, you mentioned it a little bit uh, at the beginning. Um, obviously, that has really accelerated the last like five, ten years. Have you seen that have an effect um, with player scrutiny, um, content, mm. et cetera? Risk reward is always right. there, um, is always the thing that I say. I mean, um, from my perspective, um, the, there's always one word which always springs to mind, which is, uh, and it's not a sexy word, but it's compliance is the truth. Um, you know, from a social media perspective, there are always going to be people generally in every different industry that are going to mess up and say something on social media they shouldn't do. Andre Gray, for example, when a couple of years ago when he transferred into Burnley, scored a goal against Liverpool, clever journalist decided to do a search back for his whole Twitter timeline, found some pretty horrific tweets that he'd, he'd said, a few year homophobic tweets, he said, FA retrospectively ban him. Um, wow. as a result yeah. so um, yes there in a way technology can always be used as we very much well know in the wider uh, that never before can you get as close to a player but there are lots of players we work with some great ones that have a very definitive view alongside their marketing and comms and branding team etc and sometimes that might be all the same company to say I'm not in this for the short term I'm not in this just to find some short term brand deals what I'm here to do is to actually put across an authentic point of view about whatever it might be um, conservationism or about fashion or about design yeah, yeah. Um, or about veganism or whatever else it may be um, and then I'm going to work backwards from there which is I'm going to put out content that I want to do that will that should signpost to particular brands and particular good causes that I want to be associated with that that is my down-to-earth authentic perspective that I want on things yeah. and that's the that's the good joined up approach to social and brand alignment and everything else that comes yeah. with it but most people are in in that they're interested in the uh, you know this guy slagging off this guy correct, and all the, the venom you get on well and this is the other bit that I, again I mentioned in Dundee a bit which is this whole schadenfreude yeah. um, you know I think everybody wants authenticity everyone wants to know what someone is really like but as soon as anybody says something that isn't the bland um, worn out platitudes yeah. that every footballer or every celebrity more or less says because they're scared to death of saying something that actually might cause offence or maybe a little bit out of the ordinary everybody goes crackers yeah. you know talk yeah. about Lingard um, Miami uh, whatever it was when he was in the US hotel video that went a bit viral I'm like it's just a normal guy that's been on a holiday that's yeah. got a messy hotel room that's just messing around with his pals now I'm always of the view that I would prefer footballers, celebrities, whoever it is in the public eye, to be a little bit more pragmatic about what they want to say. But everybody's scared to death of saying something because they know as soon as anything happens, they'll be jumped on. Um, And, you know, in the end, 
ultimately will retreat back to their safe zone yeah, because yeah. they know that actually that process of saying something they they might feel or mean isn't worth it. Same as Ronaldo briefly, like he's obviously in a position to be able to do it. I remember when they Portugal played Iceland, I think it must be in the I think it was in the Euros a while back. He came out pretty critically and said Iceland are rubbish, too <laughs> over physical, don't know how they ever got there and was pretty disparaging. And everybody, a lot of people came out and said, so disrespectful and all, yeah. the, all the usual stuff. The truth is, I was, I was quite impressed and refreshed that a footballer said actually what he felt. And that The thing with football, though, people are so emotional. Of course. You know, everyone's very tribal. And, and you say something against, um, you know, the club, a player at the club. And then just the thing with social media is that people use it to just vent venom. And you can be anonymous on social media. Mm. You know, you can just have some anonymous account, attack whoever. And these footballers, I mean, they get thrust into the limelight. Often, you know, their rise is quick. And, you know, you're not prepared no. for this kind of thing. No. And that's why the other thing we're seeing more of um, is uh, a growth towards at least the, 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 the more savvy agents of having a good team around the team. Yeah, so it's not yeah. just really a footballer in isolation anymore. It's a footballer with his agent, obviously, and his agent, hopefully is um, not territorial enough to know that he needs the marketing and comms person there, he needs a tax advisor, he needs an IFA, he needs a lawyer. And and, and within that team comes a, a 360 protection view, or a protect, uh, not protection view, but a team around him that's looking out for him or her for lots of different angles to make sure you can be proactive with lots of different things. No, I love that. Why do the agents have such, such a bad rep? Um, because it's the easy message to give is the truth. Um, this message comes from the clubs. Well, it can come from lots yeah. of different places is the yeah. truth. You know, uh, they're easy to scapegoat. Uh, the agent wants the move because he's going to earn more commission on a particular deal. Um, it might be that uh, the agent's trying to unsettle a particular player that's not got a good relationship with the club. The truth a lot of the time is, is that clubs for a long time never had it so good. Um, you know, in what way? back in the 80s, 90s and 2000s, even where there was lots of players without the benefit or access to agents. You know, I remember reading Alex Ferguson's book on leadership and he was talking about how Brian Robson would just bring one of the younger players um, into the boardroom and say, Fergie said, sign on the dotted line, your new contract. And you signed on the dotted line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, ultimately the you know, clubs are very much going to be looking out for their own interests and the golden age of where a player wouldn't doubt um, the financial terms that he was signing up to for a long-term deal yeah. are long gone because it's now much harder to negotiate those deals because agents are there looking after the player's interests. Yeah, yeah. Now, does that mean that all agents are fantastic and does that mean all agents are absolutely horrendous? No. Most are very much in between and a, a lot are doing a very, very good job for their clients. And the truth is, is that fans will usually always align their interest to the club's interest. But a lot of the time, as soon as a club does not want to keep a player, just as we see with Gareth Bale, um, you know, that reverse loyalty comes into play. If a player wants to leave, he's deemed disloyal. Yeah. If a club wants a player to leave, he's deemed disloyal for not accepting yeah, that yeah. the club wants him to leave. Yeah. So, you know, it's a double-edged sword. It's the same edged sword, really, where a player sometimes can't win. And I'm not saying all players are angels and that some players don't want to leave for lots of different, you know, varied reasons. But ultimately, um, you know, it's a lot more nuanced than what usually comes across. But it used to, it used to be like the players. I mean, you know, you're Liverpool, right? Yeah. Um, you know, Gerrard, Henderson. You've got a few players that have, you know, they've been at the club their whole career. But nowadays, you're, you're seeing that less. And it's okay, you know, they need to earn money if they're not being played. And so, but I think it's taken fans quite a while just to appreciate that. That these guys can come in, they can play for a few years, and then they can move somewhere else. Yep. And they're not being disloyal. They're just, you know, having short careers and wanting to, to maximise it. And that's the other thing that's worthwhile mentioning as well, which I do mention in, in the book as well, which is, you know, everybody thinks that there's very much a glamorous life of being a footballer. And it's true at the elite level, getting paid very good money for doing something that everybody loves. The truth is, is that most of those players have probably dedicated almost all of their lives to that one singular outcome, whereas most have fallen away already before that stage. And the other thing that's almost that's almost as important to say is, you know, if you are lucky as an elite footballer and even a non-elite footballer, but in League One or League Two, 
you're probably likely to have two or three long-term contracts yeah, yeah. throughout your career. Maybe four if you're very lucky that you start an elite club and you can go till you're 33, 34, and then you're on you know, downward spiral yeah, from there. Yeah. That money has to last them and their families um, until probably into their 80s is the truth with um, you know age longevity as it is now. Which means as soon as they retire, either because their skill set is so incredibly narrow, that is what they do. And unless they actually have the personality or flexible skill sets or are willing to learn and train up in a particular other industry, you know, that money has got to last in their entire career. So they are disproportionately earning during a narrow window for a very elongated period of time. And that's something that I think a lot of people don't quite get. Am I expecting lots of sympathy for high po- highly paid, high profile players? No. But at the same time, you know, there's a lot of players that won't say it's very all the ones well. underneath, yeah. And and also there's yeah a huge number of players that you know after they finished have to transition into lots of other jobs because you know they've done something and sacrificed a lot for a decent period of time and they've now got to do something different. True. On that note, thank you very much for coming in. Pleasure. Um, so done deal. Yes. You can buy the book. You can. Um, you can also listen to it on Audible, which is what I'm going to do. Yes, please. And I'll stick the link in the bottom of the show notes. If anyone wants to download it, listen, you can click the link. And uh, yeah, good luck with everything. Thank you very much. And uh, speak soon. Hey folks, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places. Mm-hmm.